welcome to the Just One End podcast. My name is Liz. Um, I just started this podcast, so welcome to episode one. Um, I started this podcast because I wanted to give it a try. Um, I've been into knitting podcasts lately. Um, a friend of mine told me about them actually just in February. I didn't really even know that they were a thing until recently. Um, so I've watched a few and caught up and, and uh, thought it looked like fun. It's this whole community that I, I didn't even know existed, so I thought it'd be fun to try and engage with people and and uh, really just chronicle my knitting um, experience and, and kind of have a, a fun thing to to do to honest, keep me honest too. I think <laughs> uh, if I'm reporting on progress on projects, then you know maybe I'll I'll, I'll be able to focus on them a little bit better. So. Um, this is actually my second attempt at recording this episode. Uh, the first one went totally sideways. Um, <laughs> first, my my daughter, uh, who's about two and a half, uh, came in probably four different times. Um, plus my son, he's five. He also popped in a couple times. Um, and then I, I kept I kept going with the recording and, and tried to uh, continue while they were upstairs having a bath um, with my husband. And um, then water started pouring from the ceiling. <laughs> um, so apparently they were splashing in the tub and now we know that there is a leak of some sort between the floor of the bathroom and the ceiling um, in my office, which is, is what we're in, um, at least around that light right there <laughs> that you can't see. So it was a little bit crazy. Um, oh, and then to top it off, when I finally pulled the video clips uh, over to my computer to check them out, it turns out I forgot to turn on the microphone. So there was no sound. So since there was nothing salvageable from that uh, first attempt, I decided to just, well, not really decided, I kinda had no choice, but uh, I, I'm starting over from scratch. So this is take two um, for episode one of, uh, of my podcast. So sorry, I'm looking off to the right here. Um, I actually have my show notes. Um, I had originally put them on my computer and I was just referencing those, um, but as I was recording, I noticed that uh, I could see the screen in, in my glasses and that was kind of driving me crazy. So instead I have a giant whiteboard <laughs> that I've written everything else, everything out on, uh, which is over to my right here. So when you see me glancing away, that's why. So a little bit about this podcast and why I decided to start it. Um, I really enjoy doing kind of a yearly goal. Um, I started a few years ago, usually it was, up until this point it was uh, cooking related. Um, so the first time I did it I made pies. Uh, I did a pie every week whether it's sweet or savory um, and then I, uh, I mostly kept track of it on Pinterest. I would pin a recipe and then I would uh, pin a review of it when I, when I was done. Um, and that was a lot of fun. So I later years I did um, soups. Uh, souffles, which actually didn't last long because it turns out that neither me or my husband actually like souffle. Um, <laughs> go figure. Uh, and then last year I did cocktails. Didn't last as long as you think. You'd think I'd be able to stick with that one, but it, it, it petered out. Um, I think the reason they petered out really is because I tried to, I tried to keep track of it with a blog. Uh, I do have a blog. I'm not going to tell you where it is because <laughs> it's not really worth reading right now. Um, but I'm just, I'm not good at taking pictures and writing posts and keeping up with all of that. So, um, so it just, it never really stuck. This year I decided to make my goal knitting related. Um, mostly because last year I hardly did any knitting and then I, I was really reinvigorated early, uh, in February this year, uh, when I went to a knitting retreat and I wanted to keep that momentum going. So I decided to make my yearly goal, um, for this year, a, a knitted project completed every month, whether it was a new project that I cast on or finishing one of my many, many whips, um, at least finish something every month and hopefully finish some extras. Um, so far, I'm doing really great at that. I've, I've got a lot of finished objects um, this year. A lot of them are socks too, which I'm not sure if I'm counting yet because I'm still working on uh, figuring out what sock recipe works for me. But anyway, we'll get into that another time. So with my, with my yearly goal and having discovered podcasts this year, I decided I'm going to go ahead and keep track of everything with um, a, a video podcast. Um, 
I, like I said, I'm not good at taking pictures. I'm not good at writing, but I am very good at talking. I can talk your ear off. Uh, my mom likes to say that if you ask me the time, I tell you how to build the clock. So I'm definitely known for being able to, uh, to talk a lot. So I figure at least the part of this journey or project uh, that involves sitting down and talking, I can, t I got that no problem. Um, we'll see how the editing goes <laughs> since I have no experience with video editing. Um, and I don't know, we'll, we'll just see what happens. So this episode I figure will be just an intro and um, tell you more about myself, my knitting journey, um, what I've done up to this point. And then we'll see how the later episodes go. Um, I'd like to certainly talk about whips. Um, I'd like to talk about upcoming projects. I know I want to focus at least one episode um, on my journey through socks because like I said, I've knit a lot lately, but I still haven't found my perfect fit. Um, so I'd like to, to do that. So um, if there's any segments that, that you enjoy in other podcasts um, that you'd really like to see me do, let me know. Um, I'd be happy to, to consider throwing that in. Um, I'm hoping this will kind of evolve organically and become whatever it is it's going to become <laughs> on its own. Um, let's see. So some of the podcasts that I've watched, though. Uh, the first one that I watched is I'll Knit If I Want To uh, by Jamie of A Beautiful Mess, sorry, Beautiful Mess Yarnworks. Um, she is a friend who I met at the retreat, actually. She's the one who told me about podcasts that I didn't even know that they existed, so so I checked her out first, uh, caught up very quickly. I, I binge watched all of her episodes, um, and then bullied her into <laughs> to releasing her latest episode. Sorry, Jamie. Um, and then from from Jamie's podcast, I uh, moved on to Legacy Knits. Um, I heard about them through her podcast, so I, I wa binge watched all of their episodes uh, with Sue and Chelsea, and then. Uh, it, it really was a branching. I mean, the ones that I start with, I usually learn about others uh, from from them. So from there, I, I watched all of Inside Number 23 uh, with Katie over in the UK. Um, I, I love her podcast. I have so much fun listening to, to her talk um, about her projects and, and her family and her adorable little pug. So, so that's the one. Uh, that I caught up with next. And then lastly, uh, the most recent one that I've caught up with is um, Eric on Sticks Plus Twine. So um, I've caught up to his latest episode. And so all of those now, I'm able to watch the newest episode when they post, which is kind of fun. Um, when you binge watch, you know, you're watching things that they recorded a year or more ago sometimes. So, <laughs> so the current events are, are a bit outdated. Um, some that I'm trying out that I, I haven't watched their whole backlog yet, but I'm at least a few episodes in and planning to continue um, catching up are The Bakery Bears, um, The Knitting Expat with Mina, and The Sockmetician uh, with Nathan. He's the one I started most recently and, and I'm really enjoying um, listening to, hit, to him. Um, there's a couple others that I have on my list, but I haven't actually made it to, to actually start listening yet, um, I'm, I'm sure that I will. If there's any that, that you like that you'd like to recommend, though, feel free to let me know. I'm always happy to, to add more to my list. Um, I am a bit of a completionist. I, <laughs> I really don't like to start things unless I can start them from the beginning. Um, so there's a couple of podcasts out there that have just, they've been on for so long that they have so many episodes. Um, a couple of them, actually, their original episodes aren't even available anymore, so I haven't started those just because if I can't start from number one, I kind of don't want to start them. So we'll see if I stick with that. Maybe there are some that you just love that you say you should totally watch this even if you haven't seen the history. Maybe I will. We'll see. <laughs> um, okay, so let me give you um, some more information about me. So like I said, my name is Liz. Uh, my name is actually um, Elizabeth Zimmerman, which if you're watching your, this podcast, you probably know of the more famous Elizabeth Zimmerman. Um, her name actually inspired the, the name of this podcast because while my name is Elizabeth Zimmerman, um, her name is spelled with two N's at the end of Zimmerman and mine is spelled with just one N. So there you go. <laughs> Obviously, I embrace the fact that I'm named Elizabeth Zimmerman. 
Um, I do get comments on it everywhere I go when it's knitting related. Every new yarn store that I go to, the minute I hand them my credit card and they read Elizabeth Zimmerman, there's, there's going to be a comment of some sort. Um, it's funny, a lot of people will say, oh, you're born to be a knitter or your mother must have known. Uh, but actually, I married into the name. So I wasn't born a Zimmerman, but I, I happily took on the name <laughs> when I married my husband. Um, speaking of which, I do have a husband. Uh, his name is Greg, and I have uh, we have two children, um, which I think I've already mentioned. But Eric is five years old, um, and Tilda is about two and a half. So um, they are just adorable and you'll probably see them pop up either through pictures or honestly probably through them <laughs> interrupting me uh, this time since I already tried earlier today it's a lot later tonight so they're already in bed so so you won't see them tonight but possibly in the future <laughs> um, I, I have a full-time job I, I work for a financial institution um, they're based out in the West they're pretty big out there. I, I won't talk about it much. Honestly, you've not necessarily heard of them, but it is one of those companies where they're very strict about um, who portrays them in the media or in the public kind of thing. So I won't go into any details on it, um, but I do work from home. Um, I am broadcasting from Cochranville, Pennsylvania, which is between Lancaster and Philadelphia. Uh, closer to Lancaster than Philly, actually. So I do live near Amish country. Uh, we moved fairly recently. We were living in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania before. Uh, not that much further, just the other side of Lancaster, uh, about an hour away from me now. Um, and it's, it's an interesting place to live because it is a tourist destination, um, which is odd when you live here. <laughs> I mean, the, the Amish are certainly uh, unique, so, so they, they attract a lot of interest and a lot of people to see them. Um, but yeah, we have Amish buggies driving by um, the house every once in a while. It's just part of life out here. So uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so as I mentioned, I work from home. Um, I worked for, from home for about nine years now. Um, I really enjoy it. It's a, it's a great way of life, honestly. <laughs> Uh, since I take my kids to daycare every day, I don't quite get the luxury of just rolling out of bed um, and working in my pajamas, but but I, I still do have a, a much more relaxed dress code than uh, my counterparts. Um, let's see. In my spare time, uh, obviously I knit. Uh, that's kind of what this whole thing is about. Um, I also sing in an a cappella group. We're a five-voice group uh, my, that my dad put together. My dad's our bass, uh, and my brother's our tenor. Um, and we sing with two other ladies that, that they know through, uh, through church. So, um, our, our name is Bonus Track. I'll, I'll link, uh, our YouTube channel below. Uh, we're not huge. Um, <laughs> we do mostly weddings, uh, retirement communities. Uh, we'll put on shows for them. Um, we have sung the national anthem at the Orioles game a few times, which is always our biggest audience. Of course, they're not there to see us, so <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Uh, but it's a lot of fun. I, I enjoy uh, singing with them. And then uh, as far as crafting goes, uh, I mostly knit. I do some crochet. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, I have sewn in the past, but I really don't do it much anymore. Um, I, I mean, when I got married, I actually made my, my bridesmaids dresses. Uh, but I think that's the last time I've really done any serious sewing um, other than you know, mending kind of things. Um, and I have done some cross stitch. I, I did count a cross stitch when I was probably a teenager, maybe a little older. Um, and then recently I, I picked it up again, if only because a uh, Sue of Legacy Knits uh, inspired me. So, so I purchased a, a year long, um, I don't know if you call it cross stitch along or <laughs> a year long pattern release um, from Clouds Factory. I believe it's Clouds Factory. Um, fabulous Women in History. So I'm several months behind. I joined late anyway, and I've only gotten, I'm almost done with the February uh, section of the pattern. But I'm having a lot of fun with that. I, it's It's been enjoyable to pick that up again. Um, and I'm knitting on, or not knitting, stitching uh, on linen for the first time, which was a lot of fun. So, um, so that's me in a nutshell. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about my knitting history. Uh, we'll show you, wheel, <laughs> I'll show you <laughs> a 
some of my past projects. Um, they're not necessarily going to be in chronological order. I've just kind of got them piled over uh, over here in front of my notes. Um, so I'll go through those. Uh, most of them, they're just kind of fun projects that I did and I had them lying around. So I, I thought I'd show them as examples of what I've done. Um, I do have a Ravelry page. Um, oh, I should probably mention this earlier. Yeah, I have a Ravelry page um, and you can find me on Instagram as Algebrina. Um, I'll try and put that below so you can see how it's spelled. Uh, it's like Algebra and Thumbelina um, <laughs> squished together. It's a really handy nickname though because it's never taken on any of the sites. It's my email address, it's all of my social media handles. Very convenient. Um, so anyway, so Algebrina, you can find me that way. So most of my early uh, knitting projects though are on Ravelry. Uh, if you want to see any more information on those. Um, but I've got a sampling to show you. So, um, knitting history. So my grandma taught me to knit. Uh, I think that's a lot of people's stories. <laughs> Her grandma taught them to knit. Uh, when I was a little kid, probably like 10 or so, uh, we had a big snowstorm. And we always have Christmas at my grandma's house. And we got uh, snowed in that Christmas. So uh, my grandma taught me how to just do a basic knit stitch. I don't even think, think she taught me to purl at that point. So it was just a basic knit stitch. Um, I made probably a one inch, one and a half inch square um, <laughs> of just garter stitch. Uh, I called it a Barbie apron because it had a tail from the cast on and I'm pretty sure that I bound off on the same side so I had little ties on either end. <laughs> So that was my very first project. I don't think I have it anymore. I probably should have saved it. Um, I, I would swear that my grandma also taught my mom to knit um, on DPNs that trip. My mom has no recollection of that though. And every time she sees me knitting on DPNs, she thinks it's like witchcraft that <laughs> you can keep that many needles straight. So I don't know, false memory, I guess. Um, but that was when I first learned to knit and then I promptly forgot for several years. Um, I didn't pick up knitting again until, I'm not actually sure, it was either my late teens or my early 20s. Um, my grandma, again, taught me to knit, again at Christmas. Um, <laughs> uh, she taught me how to knit the family Christmas stockings. Uh, we have a Christmas stocking pattern that she's used since the 50s, I think. It's, it's a very old pattern. Um, and I have a very large family. Um, well varies relative, but I have a pretty large family. My mom comes from five siblings, um, and that, sorry, comes from a family of five kids, so she has four siblings, um, and that's the side of the family that we celebrate Christmas with. Um, so all of my aunts and uncles and all of my cousins and um, the next generation down, they all have the same Christmas stocking. It's a red stocking with a white cuff. Um, the name used to be just embroidered on. I when I took it over, I kind of changed it so that it gets um, knit in with intarsia, which was a fun little challenge. Um, but I'm jumping ahead of myself. Anyway, <laughs> so she taught me how to knit the family Christmas stockings and then promptly handed off that job to me. So now I knit the family Christmas stockings. Um, basically, it means that the first thing I ever learned to knit, besides my little Barbie apron, uh, was a sock, a, a big sock. So I learned how to do, um, you know, cuff down, heel flat, gusset, uh, toe, kitchener stitch, uh, all of that with, with my first knitting project. And that's all I did for years. Um, well, at least a couple of years, uh, depending on whether I learned in my late teens or my early twenties. <laughs> so I, uh, so that was what I knit for a really long time. Um, I still knit them. It's still my job to knit the family, family Christmas stockings. I think I have probably probably eight or 10 under my belt at this point. Um, I have like five, I think, that I need to knit before the end of the year. Uh, I'm hoping to jump on them earlier than Thanksgiving, like I did last year. <laughs> so actually there's a couple of carryovers from last year uh, that I need to finish up. So uh, so that's, that's an ongoing, forever going project is that I, I knit those stockings. But um, I was interested in expanding my horizons. So, um, it was probably, I think, I think I decided four or five years ago now um, that I went and sought out a, a knitting class. Um, I looked online. 
I found that there was a local knitting store, or sorry, a local yarn store, um, only about 10 minutes away from where I was living at the time. And uh, that was Flying Fibers in Landisville, Pennsylvania. Um, I love that store. It's a mother-daughter team that, that own it and run it. Um, they raise their own sheep. They do rare, rare breed um, British wool, uh, British breeds, I believe. I'm probably getting everything wrong, but <laughs> they're, they're really great. I, I love that shop. So uh, I was discovering them for the first time when I looked online, actually. Um, they had some of their wool listed and they had pictures of the sheep that they came from, which I just thought was the most adorable thing ever. So I went and checked them out, uh, signed up for this class that they, that they were offering, and it was a sampler shawl. So the class was, I think it was done in three parts. Um, you know, you started learning a technique and then you'd go home and finish some homework and, and come back and forth. Um, and this shawl was, seriously, it was really great for a beginning knitter. Um, you know, I knew how to knit, I knew how to purl, uh, I knew how to cast on. I, I knew how to cast off at least with a Kitchener stitch because I'd been doing that for a long time, but I didn't really know a lot of bind off uh, techniques. So this shawl was, um, it, I mean, it was called a sampler shawl. It was, it was a triangle shawl where each section was a different type of technique. So there was twisted stitches, there were bobbles, there was lace. Um, there's all sorts of things in the shawl. So not only did I learn how to knit all of these different um, techniques, it also taught me how to read a pattern um, because the designer had put into the pattern different ways to write things out. So each section not only approached a different technique, um, it might be written a different way. Like sometimes somebody will just say increase. Sometimes it'll say make one right. Sometimes it'll just say make one. Um, so she wrote things out in a different way throughout the pattern, which meant when I came across that in future patterns, um, I was already comfortable with it. I already knew how to interpret what the, uh, what the designer was going for. Um, and it was just a really cool way to, to learn to go beyond my stockings, um, get out of my comfort zone and really try some new things. So I definitely credit that class, uh, with getting, getting me into, um, some more serious knitting and, and, and more interesting projects, um, than just my giant socks. <laughs> so anyway, so from, from that class, I started knitting all of the things. I went crazy for a while. I just, <laughs> I was constantly knitting. Um, I don't have most of it with me. I, I, I did not, well, the first time I did this, I went through a giant list of projects and I realized I don't really need to show all of these. So <laughs> I just pulled out a couple of the more interesting ones. Um, so this is one of my first, first projects that I did. So this is, um, it's actually called the Coney Island bag. That's the, the name of the pattern. Um, I use it as a beach bag. This, I made it out of cotton yarn. It's the um, Taki Yarns Cotton Classic Color, according to my Ravelry notes. Um, I did it in blue and yellow and green, and you can see each hexagon has two colors. Um, and the way that they're knit up is that you actually pick up the edges of the surrounding hexagons uh, when you cast on. And so you just cast them on, knit each one, and move on to each one. Um, as you get to it in the pattern. The only seaming really is these corners here. Um, because the, the hexagons just take shape, like you can see the bottom of the bag, it's just folded over hexagon there, two hexagons joined there. Um, the, really the only seaming was these corners when it was one hexagon folded in half, and so you, you seam the top there. Um, it's a really cool pattern. Uh, looking at it again, I'd love to make it again. It's really neat to see it shape up because you, I can't remember where you start exactly, but once you start turning some corners and you start joining things, like it's just the shape of a bag all of a sudden. There are a million ends. Um, I would probably be better at managing my ends these days. They're kind of popping out a little bit, <laughs> but uh, it's, it was really fun to do. Um, it does have a garter stitch edge at the top. Um, and then it, I believe it called for a garter stitch, um, strap, but I didn't, I don't know why I didn't, but I didn't really feel like doing that. So instead I took, uh, I made, I'll try and do this. 
um, I made eye cords one out of each of the colors um, and then I braided those together which was pretty cool to do uh, you know I basically made the eye cord braided them and then uh, seamed them at the end um, I actually made them too long which is why they're in a giant knot there <laughs> But, uh, but this is a great bag. Um, since it's cotton yarn, it dries really well. Uh, so, and it stretches like crazy. So, um, it's a great beach bag. We put all of our towels and, and, uh, sunblock and swimsuits in here. And it's awesome. So that was one of my early projects. Um, from there, I actually knit a hemlock ring blanket, um, from the same yarn. So it was, it was the same cotton uh, cotton classics. Um, I think I did it in blue and the hemlock ring blanket. I think it's a blanket and maybe a shawl. It, it's a pie shawl style. I believe you would call it. It starts with a circular cast on, um, just with, you know, eight stitches in a little circle. And then you branch out from there. In the end, I think it, oh, I think it probably had 500 plus stitches, uh, in the round, which was a quite the undertaking to bind off and block and <laughs> it was, it's a labor of love. Um, but I gave that away as a wedding present. So I don't have that anymore. Um, I have one picture of it. I don't know how good it is really. Uh, I'll pop it in here if I can figure out how to do that. Um, <laughs> but not a great picture, but you can, you get the idea. Um, it, I believe it's a Brooklyn tweed pattern. Um, Jared flood, maybe. I'll have to look that one up. I, I looked up all the rest of them. I, I forgot to look that one up. Um, but that was a really cool blanket to do. Um, it was my first time doing lace. It was my first time doing such a big project. Um, I'd really love to go back and do it again. Um, like I said, I use cotton. It's pretty stringy. Um, you know, it doesn't have any um, Oh, squishiness to it. <laughs> Cotton's not known for being a squishy yarn. Uh, so I'd like to try it again. Um, maybe something a little more wooly um, and and see how it knits up then. But anyway, so, so that's what I did next. Um, I also branched out into some stuffies. Uh, so I've got a couple that, with me that I'll show you. Uh, my first stuffy was this guy right here. So this is um, Teddy Bear. <laughs> the pattern is called Teddy Bear. Um, it was, let me see, I have this written down. Uh, it's an Erica Knight pattern. Um, I used Universal Yarn, Cotton Supreme, um, Batik, I believe it is. Uh, this is the Waffle Cone colorway. Um, I, a lot of this is, is cotton. Uh, I actually don't knit with cotton that much anymore, so I guess it was a face, but anyway. So this guy, he was knit in pieces uh, and seamed together. Uh, he was my first stuffy, his big old Buddha belly. Um, <laughs> so that was, uh, I made him for, for my son Eric when, when he was little. Um, and now he lives in the toy room. So uh, from there, I've also made a couple of crocheted toys. Uh, like I said, I crochet um, a little bit. I mostly knit. I will crochet sometimes, but mostly I, I knit. But this is my octopus. Uh, you can see his eight tentacles. He actually has a little friend who's probably about half the size he is. Uh, I couldn't find him though. So he's somewhere kicking around. But this is also in the Universal Yarns Cotton Supreme Batik. Um, this is the Fresh Bouquet colorway. So it's actually, you probably can't see it very well in this light because I chose a terrible time to record. Um, but he's actually got purples and creams. So it's... There you go. Um, <laughs> purples and greens in there. So it's called Fresh Bouquet. And he's got these giant button eyes that I just love. So he was uh, one of my stuffies. And then my most recent one is um, this elephant. The, the pattern's actually called Elijah. And he was knit, let's see, in Kramer Tatami Tweed. Um, I love this yarn. I bought so much of this yarn <laughs> when my daughter Tilda was born. I made her probably two or three sweaters. I made a car seat um, swaddler cozy. It's on my Ravelry page if you want to see it. Um, but I made I made so much out of this yarn. But it's just adorable. This is a, a purple. Um, the colorway is called Sleepyhead. 
Um, what I love about Elijah though is that he's a seamless stuffy. So I just, you pick up and knit each of the pieces. You don't have to knit it separately and then put it together. Um, I love seamless projects. I think it's the procrastinator in me. If I have to knit things separately and then put them together afterwards, I tend to put off that second step of actually putting them together. Um, I also put off blocking. I, I'm a terrible procrastinator. <laughs> so, but that's Elijah. So he was my, my latest stuffy. I haven't made anything stuffy wise since him, but um, I should probably add some to my list and, and get some more out there. Um, so let's see. Um, also for my son, I'll show you this one. This is probably my favorite project to date. Um, I don't know if it's because, well, it was the most challenging thing I knit at the time. I think I've probably challenged myself a bit more since then. Um, but this is a cabled cardigan. It's called Cardigan for Mary, M-E-R-R-Y. Um, that's the pattern name. And it is available on Ravelry. And you can see it's got a cabled um, button band here that goes all the way up the hood and across and down, down the other side. And I love these wooden um, toggle buttons, I guess. Um, they're really fun. But this is like an 18 month size. This is the first garment I ever made. Um, it's actually still the first. Well, I've made a couple of baby sweaters since, but I haven't ventured out into a grown up sweater. I've started some. I've got a couple on the needles now, actually. Um, but this is my first finished complex uh, cardigan and, and sweater like that. So this was knit in an alpaca merino blend. Um, that unfortunately I don't, I don't remember who made it because I picked it up at the uh, local farmer's market, um, that an alpaca farm was selling some yarn at. So I'm sure I could probably find it. I'll, I'll try and find it and see if I can figure out, uh, whose yarn it was, but it's super soft. I love this yarn. Um, but <laughs> the saga that comes with this sweater is that, um, when I had finished knitting the back piece and both side pieces. I realized I had a problem with the side piece. I'm pretty sure that I knit two of the same. Um, so one of them was just wrong. It was the wrong direction. So I had to rip it up, which is always sad. Um, but then after I ripped it out, um, I looked down at my remaining pieces and I realized the piece that I'd ripped out was the back, which is the biggest of the pieces I did already and also had nothing wrong with it. <laughs> it was, I just totally ripped out an entire section of knitting that I didn't need to. It was, oh, it was the saddest thing ever. I was, <laughs> I was torn up by that. So I, I think it took me a little while to, to motivate myself to cast on again, to knit not only the back, but also the piece that I'd originally meant to rip out, um, to, to fix the side. So that was fun. Um, and then also my kid, uh, actually, both my kids have giant heads. I know this every time I knit something for them that's a hat or a hood. You would think I would learn, but actually this was the first time, so I didn't know this by then. But um, I knit this hood. I probably stopped about here, uh, according to the pattern or measurements or whatever it was. Um, and then I put it on him, and it did not fit him. It was, his shoulders were basically <laughs> scrunched up because he couldn't pull his, pull his shoulders down from the hood. Um, so I had to rip it out. And I knit a couple more inches. Um, I think I had to rip it out three times actually before I actually got it to fit in. Um, the problem with that is that as you can see, there is cabling across the hood too. And this is a seamed, seamed hood. You're knitting from the bottom up. So I had to Kitchener the whole thing here. And then I had to figure out how to seamlessly Kitchener in cable um, across the front of the hood. So I had to do that three times. <laughs> Honestly, I'm thrilled with how it actually turned out now. Um, I think it's pretty seamless. You can't really see, uh, you know, that it, that it breaks there. It's, I think the pattern's slightly off, but like I said, you can't really tell. So I love this sweater though. I'm a little bit sad because Tilda didn't get a chance to wear it because by the time it was the right season, she'd already outgrown it. So unfortunately it just made it through arc. Um, I think at this point it'll probably get saved for grandkids. 
um, which means I've got many, many years <laughs> before this will make another appearance. Um, so that, let's see, uh, while I'm showing you things for kids, um, I'll show you one thing that I knit last year. I, last year was rough, um, work-wise. I had a lot of work that I was doing, uh, working a lot of long hours. I just, I did not knit hardly at all last year. Um, but this is one that I did knit. So this is a dress that I made, here I'll back up, for Miss Tilda. Um, it is, let's see, oh, I don't think I wrote down the yarn, so I'm not sure what the yarn is, but I'll post it later. Probably a cotton, like, like I said, I don't really knit with cotton that often, but it's what I have around. Which makes sense, when you're knitting for kids, you want it to be durable and washable, so what I have around is stuff I've knit for my kids. Um, so, <laughs> so that's, that's the material you'll see. Um, now this dress, I knit it up on a, on a vacation. Uh, my whole family went down to the beach together last year. Um, like I said, well, I have a big family. My mom comes from five siblings. Uh, so do I. I I'm in the middle of five kids. Um, and three of my four siblings are married with children. Um, and all of us, including my parents, went down to a beach house uh, in the Outer Banks last year. Which was so much fun. Uh, we've been wanting to do it for ages and it was... It was really a good time. Some Sometime we'll, we'll hopefully be able to do it again. <laughs> but, um, so I took this as my project for the trip. Um, so I started it while I was down there. I finished it while I was down there, which I was pretty happy about. Um, and, uh, yeah, and she got to wear it last summer. Unfortunately, she's kind of outgrown it a bit. So what I'm hoping to do is actually add more ruffles to the bottom here. I haven't quite figured out how um, I think the next one will be fairly easy because I can pick up in the pink and do a pink ruffle underneath. It just has to be a little longer. Um, so anyway, I, I'm working on how to do it. But if I can add a little bit of length to it, then she can get more wear out of it because then it just becomes an empire waist, uh, which honestly I thought would have looked better in the first place anyway. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm hoping she can, she can maybe get a couple more summers uh, out of that one. So those are the stuff I've knit for my kids. Um, let me show you one more thing before I get into some more recent stuff. Um, this is, I'm going to put them on real quick. Um, this is probably my favorite knit project um, that I use most often. Um, you wouldn't think so, I guess. I, I don't know. You might. So, so these are some fingerless mitts. Um, they are... The pieces of eight pattern you can see they're very swirly hopefully you can see um, they have a really cool construction to them basically you cast on all of these stitches and you just kind of decrease to get the shape um, the swirl goes around the thumb on both sides um, it's really cool I loved knitting these um, and I use them all the time um, this was, so like I said, it's the pieces of eight pattern. Uh, the yarn is Claudia hand painted yarns in the Argyle colorway. Um, I think it's been discontinued, so I'm not sure if you can get your hands on it now, but it's really cool. Uh, just a really cool project. I wear them all the time. Um, uh, if I'm cold and I want to knit, these are perfect because obviously fingerless gloves, they stay out of your way. Uh, they actually, you know, because they go down below my knuckles too, they really do stay out of the way but they're really warm. So I really like these mitts. Um, if you uh, follow me on Instagram, you'll actually see. <laughs> I think I'm wearing them in a couple of pictures there. Um, let's see. Okay, and then this project that I'll show you is another um, labor of love. This one takes a long time. Well, it, I feel like it took a long time probably just because it was my first blanket. Um, I did use a bulky yarn. I used the Marble Chunky in the blue-purple colorway. I checked. That really is the name of the colorway. I thought maybe I just wrote down a descriptive color, but <laughs> it turns out it is called blue-purple. Um, this is the Garter Stitch Blanket by Elizabeth Zimmerman. Um, I got it from... I don't think the pattern's available online because I had to buy a book in order to get the pattern. Um, a friend of mine was knitting it. I think she was on her second or third, um, and it just looked like a really cool idea uh, or construction. 
simple knit. I mean, it's garter stitch. It's a garter stitch blanket. Um, but the way that it's knit up is really cool. You actually knit, um, you knit it in sections and they're different shapes. So there's actually two shapes that are uh, basically L shapes and they fit together. And then you've got some C shapes that go around and they all get seamed together. I don't usually like seamed projects as I've mentioned, uh, but this one's really cool. So it's huge. I, I can't actually show you the whole thing. This is it folded in half even. Um, but the way that it's put together, let me show you a little bit of the seams. So you can see here, you can see where the corners are turned. Um, I chose to leave eyelets so you can see some holes there. And then this is where I crocheted together the pieces. Um, so I like the crocheted edge. Some people don't like to use that because it leaves a bump. Um, but I, I actually like it. I think it adds a design element. Um, so I use it as the right side or wrong side, either way. You can see there's a section where it's all, all four pieces seam together. So it's a really cool blanket. Um, I can't, I believe the book is called The Opinionated Knitter. Um, it's actually a collection of the different newsletters. Um, that Elizabeth Zimmerman put out. So it's a really cool book. I haven't did anything else from it yet, but you know, it's on my list. I'm planning to at some point. This blanket gets used all the time though. This lives on my couch. It's so squishy. I actually call it my squashy blanket in my projects. Um, <laughs> it's so warm and squishy. It just, it lives on my couch. Um, so speaking of blankets, um, the last blanket I'm going to show you is one that I finished recently. Um, as I mentioned last year, I hardly did any knitting. Um, this is one project that languished for quite a while. I, I started it when I was pregnant with Tilda and she's now two and a half. So that gives you an idea of how long ago that was, um, intending to make it for her. So with Eric, uh, I kind of had a monkey thing going. I had, I got him, you know, monkey stuffed animals and monkey themed uh, blankets and laundry hampers and <laughs> everything monkey themed. Um, and with Tilda, I decided to go with elephants. Um, Elijah was one that I knit for her with the elephant theme. Uh, she's got a bunch of other elephants uh, in her life now. Um, so this pattern I picked out because of the elephants. Let me show you. So you can see there's green elephants marching along. And sorry, I'm going to see how I can show this. Um, and there's five repeats of the elephant and they march in different directions. There we go. Um, so this blanket is knit in bamboo pop, which I love. Oh, bamboo is just the softest yarn and it's so durable and washable. And yeah, I just, I love bamboo pop. Um, so I knit this blanket out of that. Um, the pattern is called elephant blanket actually, oddly enough. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I knitted in three colors. It's green, uh, for the elephants, the accent color is the pink. And then the, the basic background is just a cream color. Um, I didn't like the border that was with the, the, with the pattern. So I just crocheted, uh, stripes in the three colors. Sorry if you can't see this very well. Um, so I, I crocheted the stripes and then on the edge, I took these two of the colors and just made loops, um, which honestly is the most fiddly way to do an edge. <laughs> Basically you chain five in one color, attach it, drop it, pick up the other color, chain five and attach it, drop that, pick up the other color again. <laughs> so over and over again, you're just hardly doing anything just dropping it and uh, it's very fiddly. It takes a long time but I really liked the effect. Um, I didn't think that just the, the edge, um, I don't know. I didn't think it finished it well. So, so I like the little loopy. And then I also backed it with this soft fuzzy minky. So this is minky fabric. It's just in white. Um, doesn't quite match the cream, but I don't mind. So, <laughs> so it's quite a substantial, um, blanket weight wise. It, it's quite heavy and very warm. Um, I love this blanket. The really cool thing about this is that it's actually knit in the round and then steaked. So I did the knitting portion. I think I finished it about a year, year and a half ago, maybe. 
Um, I remember I took it on a cruise with me, <laughs> and so I did a lot of the knitting then. Um, and then I steeked it at home, and then I added on the, the border, and then it just sat there. Um, I just did not get around to blocking it for ages and ages. So I actually moved from our old house to this house with it unblocked. It, it just sat there. <laughs> so uh, I even had it on blocking wires, but I got interrupted and never got back to finishing it. Pathetic. So anyway, so I finally blocked it. I promised myself that I would um, get it blocked and hopefully finished by um, last Feb or this past February uh, when I went to the knitting retreat um, that Flying Fibers puts on. And I almost made it. I didn't quite finish it beforehand. I got it blocked. I started putting on the backing. Um, and then I actually had to finish sewing on the backing there. So I don't know if I'll be able to show you this. But I actually, I used a blanket stitch. Uh, I don't know if it'll focus. But I used a blanket stitch, uh, which I love. I think it turned out really well. It holds it. Um, it's invisible on the knit side, which is very cool. Um, so yeah, so I actually had a, a couple of ladies staying up with me um, <laughs> that first night of the retreat to make sure that I got this done. So, <laughs> so I finished this, this blanket um, in while I was there at the retreat, and uh, it became my February finish object for my um, for my yearly goal. I did finish something in January. I think it was just a hat. So. Anyway, so that is um, my elephant blanket. Now, like I said, I made it for Tilda. Uh, I started it when I was pregnant. I intended to give it to her. Um, she couldn't care less about it, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, uh, my kids are just, at this point, they are very young. They're five and two and a half, so they, they are not knit worthy yet. Um, I have hopes that they will be someday. <laughs> But she has, I mean, who can blame her? She's two and a half. She's already attached to a blanket. Uh, it's actually a, a hand-me-down from, from Eric. It's a monkey blanket, strangely enough. Um, <laughs> so she's already attached to that one. She doesn't want to give it up. So um, so she does not use this blanket much. I, however, use it all the time. It's, it's the other uh, blanket that's living on my couch all the time. And it also is featured in, in many of my Instagram pictures because it is constantly on my lap. So that is my, the saga of my elephant blanket. Um, but that knitting retreat that, that I went to in February, um, it's actually their second annual. I went last year too. I got a lot of knitting done there last year, um, but then I didn't really get a lot done afterwards when I came home. This year, I don't know what it was. I was just super inspired and motivated and I came home and did everything. Like I cast on so many projects. Um, I've all of a sudden branched out into to using project bags and progress keepers. And <laughs> I'm sure it's the, the uh, influence of all the podcasters that I've been watching. Um, since I, you know, watch knitting podcasts in my downtime, of course I want to be knitting while I'm doing that. So, so I've just been doing a ton of knitting. Um, so I'm just going to show you my two most recent projects. Uh, I started them, um, oh. I don't remember exactly when I actually no okay so the hat I started the hat about three days ago uh, I guess four days ago um, let me show you I'm not sure how well that'll that'll show up but um, I'm calling it a lacy summer hat it's just a slouchy lightweight hat um, especially working from home I don't necessarily want to wash my hair all the time but I have to go out in public so throwing on a hat is a great thing to do sometimes I get sick of my baseball hat so so I knit myself a hat. Um, the pattern, I think, is called, uh, I always want to say it's Pikachu, but I know it's not. So I believe it's Pikachu Peak. Um, the Pikachu Peak hat, I think that's a state park in Arizona, from what Google told me. Um, I Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Somebody's probably yelling, no, that's not it. But <laughs> anyway, that's what I'm calling it. Um, the yarn is Hedgehog Fibers, um, it's the, her Skinny Singles, and I got it in the Salty Tails colorway. Um, this is my first time knitting with Hedgehog Fibers, so I was really excited to do that. The colors are gorgeous. Oh, I love this yarn. So it's mostly gray, um, but it's also got these great pops of purple and orange and red. Um, if you go on my Instagram, I've got a, a up-close picture of it while I was blocking it, and there's just this one red stitch that just pops out. I love it. So anyway, so I love this yarn. 
um, Flying Fibers actually started carrying it. Like I said, I've moved away from them, <laughs> but I still pop up every once in a while. Um, we're actually in the process of selling our old house now, even though we moved a long time ago. Uh, so I, I've gone over a few times, and any time I'm in the area, I try and, and make sure I pop in. But I happened to have a couple of days off last week, and they launched Hedgehog Fibers at Flying Fibers. Um, so I was there right as the door opened. I got my first pick of, of all the colors they had. Uh, I think I grabbed four four different skeins. Um, so anyway, I love love that yarn. So, uh, so this one, it was a quick knit. Like I said, I started it a few days ago. I blocked it yesterday, but honestly, I overblocked it. Um, I used my, my Pampered Chef cake stand, which I've never used before. I've had it for quite a while, and I used it to block a hat. So, <laughs> uh, but it was too big. It's, I think it's 13 inches in diameter, and if you read tutorials online of how to block a hat with a plate, they recommend using a 10 inch plate. So I think it was just too much. The, the ribbing has stretched out. I don't mind the slouch of it, but the ribbing is, it's not tight at all. So it's really just draped on. Honestly, I had to pin it because um, when I recorded it the first time, it kept sliding back. So anyway, so I'm going to try and re-block it and see if I can get it a little bit closer to the size that I, I want. Um, if not, I've got enough yarn that I could do it again. <laughs> and like I said, it's quick. So we'll see. I might do that. Um, and then the other most recent uh, project that I have that I blocked at the same time is this. So this is my Metalouse, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, shawl by Stephen West. This is my first Stephen West pattern. Um, I am thrilled with it. I love the way this knits up. I love that green section there. So that's actually done with a slip stitch. Um, it is a free pattern on Ravelry. Um, I walked into what is now my local yarn store, uh, which is um, Stitches with Style in Newark, Delaware. Uh, yes, Delaware is the closest <laughs> yarn store to me, even though I'm in Pennsylvania. Um, and they had some yarn in, in a bag to be sold as a kit, um, specifically for the shawl. So I picked it up. Um, the yarn is, I'm going to pronounce these wrong. Both of them are a little bit um, tricky. So Lang Yarns Mill Colory Baby is the multicolored yarn, which is the pink and the green, um, and I guess there's reds in there, oranges. It's just lots of colors. Um, so the colorway is actually number 845. It doesn't have a name. And then the green section there is the um, Schopel Wall Cashmere Queen. I got cashmere queen part. Um, and again, the colorway is a number. It's 1144 uni, U-N-I. So, um, so that's that. I, I have not done a lot of shawl knitting. I've knit a couple in the past, um, but I don't really use them. I usually end up get, giving them away. But I, I decided, you know, I'm going to try it again, uh, mostly because I didn't realize people a lot of times wear shawls as scarves, um, which I think looks great. So, you know, this one. Just kind of wrap it around and it's tucking in my hat, but you know, that's a nice cozy scarf. It's a bit warm now, but, um, but also I actually, because I work from home, um, you know, I put her around the house. I might be wearing, uh, honestly, if I don't have to drop off the kids, every once in a while my, uh, my husband takes them either to his parents for the day or, or he'll drop them off. Um, and so if I'm sitting around in my pajamas, um, then I will use a, a shawl in, in the uh in my office just to keep a bit warm so it's a great just drape over shawl too so anyway so i'm back into shawl knitting i do have the exploration station uh in my queue i've actually downloaded the pattern i've bought the yarn for it it's actually sitting as an open tab in my my google chrome uh window so i will hopefully be casting that on soon uh, but i've got some other things i need to to finish up first um, I think that's all I wanted to show you. Um, this actually went a lot longer than I intended. Uh, one thing that I really like about Jamie, um, Jamie's podcast, the I'll Knit If I Want To, uh, is that it's short. She usually keeps it around 30 minutes. Having tried to go through the backlog of a lot of podcasts, um, when they're longer, it just takes a really long time to catch up. So I was thinking, you know, I'll try and keep it on the shorter side, maybe 30 to 45 minutes. Um, but I just looked at the clock and I'm 
pretty close to an hour now. <laughs> Maybe with editing it'll be a little shorter. So anyway, like I said, I'm sure that it will just evolve and become whatever it's going to become. Um, but that is the episode for today. Thank you for joining me. Hopefully I'll have another one up pretty soon. Um, maybe weekly, maybe bi-weekly. We'll see. Um, but I appreciate the time that you spent with me and hopefully you enjoyed it as well. I'll, I'll see you next time. Bye.